Welcome to this webcast on contracts. My name is Philip Brophy from Matthews Falby Lawyers and I look forward to presenting to you. This webcast will look at the key elements of contracts which we use in commerce and everyday life. Whenever we spend money, there is usually a written or verbal contract involved. We will consider the formation of a contract, who can enter into a contract if there is a company involved, the key elements of a contract and how contracts can be varied and terminated. We will also look at legislation designed to protect consumers and small businesses against unfair contract terms. This webcast is designed for everyone, so, so stay tuned in and learn about the exciting world of contract law. So how are contracts formed? Um, let's deconstruct uh, uh, the elements of a, of a contract. Um, there are five elements, offer, acceptance, consideration, intention and certainty and completeness. So the first element, offer. One party makes a clear statement to the other indicating their intention to be bound on certain terms without further negotiation. If the offer is accepted, a binding contract will be formed. The intention of the party making the offer and that of the party accepting it is the key. A formal written contract stating sign here is an obvious example of an offer. Verbal offers can also be binding if accepted. Simple written offers may also be binding, for example, email exchanges or uh, a case of a, of a contract written on a napkin in a restaurant may well be binding. Um, parties may also intend for offers to be non-binding. For example, people often enter into a letter of intent, which we'll discuss later. Um, you might have heard of the term invitation to treat. What, what is an invitation to treat? An invitation to treat is a statement from A to B inviting B to make an offer to A on certain terms. Invitations to treat are commonly used by suppliers of goods or services to avoid a commitment to sell those goods and services at the quoted or advertised price. So typically uh, goods on display in a, in a shop, department store, whatever, are invitations to treat. This is useful from the supplier's point of view if uh, the supplier might run out of stock or the price of the materials uh, has increased in the intervening period or to avoid a commitment if the price is wrongly displayed. Terms of trade will usually state words to the effect, a quote from the supplier is not an offer, it is an invitation to the purchaser to submit a purchase order in other words, an offer to the supplier. A contract will only be formed when the purchaser submits a purchase order to the supplier and the supplier accepts the purchase order. A quote will only be valid for a certain period of time, for example, 30 days after which it will lapse. What about tenders? Um, a call for tenders is generally seen as an invitation to treat unless it states uh, in the terms of the tender that the party calling for tenders can create a contract by simply accepting the tender. The next element is acceptance. Acceptance must be unconditional and equivocal. It can occur through words or conduct. For example, it might arise through the performance of a contract. Acceptance must be communicated to the party making the offer, in other words, the offeror, in any manner stipulated by the offeror, for example, by written notice email to the offeror's email address before 5pm on a certain date. Acceptance is effective when it is received by the offeror. Acceptance must correspond with the terms of the offer. A counteroffer on different terms is not acceptance and will be regarded as a new offer, what's often called a counteroffer. These days, many offers and acceptances are communicated over the internet. Acceptance can be affected by return email, which is effective when received in the offeror's email server. Clicking an I accept button on the terms and conditions pop up when you buy something online. Or uh, continuing to browse a website when you've been given notice of its terms of use, if those terms provide that acceptance of those terms, uh, provide that acceptance will arise in that way. 
So often uh, in this area it uh, turns to a, a battle of paperwork or a battle of the forms. Um, problems will arise when B, in purporting to accept A's offer, adds to or modifies the terms of the offer. For example, B might sign the return the signed contract to A, but has cr might have crossed out some terms and initial some changes without A's approval. B uh, might have added some handwriting in the margin of the document. B might return the signed form of acceptance to A, but might annex its own terms and conditions to the contract. So to avoid this uncertainty, A should clearly state in its correspondence with B words along the following lines. This offer is accepted on the basis that neither party is bound unless and until B returns the signed contract without any alterations to A and A accepts the contract by signing it. Um, the next element is consideration. For a contract to be legally enforceable, it must be supported by consideration. Now, consideration is something of value which is exchanged between the parties. Examples of that include A agreeing to supply goods to B in return for B paying a sum of money to A. That, that's the most obvious case of contracts which happens all the time. Uh, and the other example is an exchange of promises to do something between A and B. That's called a bilateral contract. Uh, another example is, for example, where A pays an advertised reward to B for finding his lost dog. That would be called a unilateral contract. Um, on the flip side, a gratuitous promise or a gift is not supported by consideration. Two examples of this would be A agrees to give his TV to B as he no longer needs it. This is a gift to B as he is no not required to do anything in exchange for the promise. B cannot sue to enforce this promise if A reneges and decides not to give his TV away. Um, conversely, if A agrees to give his TV to B, if B helps him move house, there is binding consideration as B has agreed to perform something in exchange for and in reliance on the promise. B can sue to enforce this promise provided he performs his end of the bargain. Now, consideration does not need to be for adequate or fair value. This is the reason why related parties, such as a husband and wife, sometimes transfer assets between themselves for a token amount of a dollar. A transfer for nothing would not be legally enforceable, as it would be a gift, but a transfer for a dollar will be a valid consideration. This is not to say that there may be other reasons why this is problematic, such as under the bankruptcy laws, where things are transferred at undervalue. Now, in practice, consideration won't be an issue in most arm's length commercial contracts, as the parties have clearly exchanged something for value, for example, services in return for money. Problems might arise where one party agrees to give up something, such as where one party releases the other party from liability in exchange for payment of money, or where one party to litigation agrees to drop its claim against the other, where one party agrees to accept part payment of a debt and waive the rest. In these cases, it may not be clear that both parties are benefiting or receiving something of value from the exchange. Where there is any doubt about consideration, the parties should express the document to be a deed rather than an agreement, as a deed does not require consideration to be legally binding. Uh, the next element is intention. The parties must intend to enter into a legally binding relationship. So it's the objective, not the subjective intention of the parties that uh, matters. What would a reasonable person in the position of the parties have intended by those words or conduct? It is presumed that the parties to a commercial relationship intend for their agreements to be legally binding. Um, so, uh, are heads of agreement or are letters of intent binding? Well, that, that de depends on, on the detail, of course. Uh, heads of agreement or letter of intent 
uh, also might be known as a memorandum of understanding or term sheet. It's generally intended to be a preliminary agreement, uh, in other words, an agreement in principle, uh, and the, the parties don't intend for it to give rise to legally binding relations. However, a heads of agreement may give rise to binding legal relations if not drafted properly. Um, the High Court, in a case of Masters and Cameron, um, held that the words subject to contract have three possible interpretations depending on the intention of the parties. The parties might intend to be immediately bound by the terms of the heads of agreement with a more detailed agreement to follow. The parties might intend to be bound by the heads of agreement but performance of their obligations is subject to and conditional upon signing of a formal document. Thirdly, the parties may not intend to be bound unless and until they enter into a formal contract. Therefore, merely saying subject to contract in your heads of agreement or other document may not be clear enough and may lead to problems. Parties should clearly express in their heads of agreement which terms they intend to be binding and which terms they do not intend to be binding. Parties generally intend for clauses relating to issues such as confidentiality, exclusivity and governing law to be binding. Parties generally do not intend for the deal terms, uh, in other words, the terms peculiar to that uh, arrangement, such as the price, the quantity of goods or the timeline for completion and performance to be binding. The fifth element is certainty and completeness. The terms of the agreement or the contract must be sufficiently clear, must be sufficiently certain to be enforceable. A contract will be uncertain or incomplete if the language is incapable of meaning, not just ambiguous, such that the courts are unable to determine the intention of the parties. Um, it'll also be uncertain if the essential terms of the contract have not been agreed on and there is no mechanism by which those terms can be agreed. So what is enforceable? Um, a contract for the sale of goods may well be enforceable, even if there is no clearly defined price for the goods, so long as there is some mechanism by which the price can be determined. For example, a specified calculation or reference to an international price, such as Brent crude oil, may be perfectly binding. Um, what is not enforceable? An agreement to agree, in other words, where the parties uh, say they'll reach agreement on the price at a later date, is unenforceable. An agreement to negotiate in good faith, which is seen in many contracts, is also unenforceable. So turning now to the formalities, the, the contracts need to be signed. There is a presumption that a party which has signed a contract intends to be bound by the contract. Even if that party has not read or understood the contract, there may be vitiating factors such as fraud, duress or mental incapacity, um, but generally there is a presumption that the parties intend to be bound. The lack of a signature on a contract may not be fatal. A party may accept a contract through its conduct, in other words, by paying, or paying for or performing the services. Where there is no signed contract, terms can be incorporated by one party giving notice of its terms to the other party at or prior to the time of the contract being formed. For example, a ticket to a venue uh, may say conditions apply on the back with a sign outside the venue displaying the conditions of entry that can be seen before the ticket is bought. It's critical that that is available before the contract is entered into and the ticket is bought. Terms can also be incorporated by reference. A contract may state that is subject to our standard website terms and conditions. Um, nevertheless, it's preferable to supply, for suppliers to provide a copy of their terms of trade to customers at or prior to the time of contract formation and ideally to receive a signed acknowledgement 
of receipt as evidence of that. So what about verbal contracts? There is no general requirement for contracts to be in writing. Verbal contracts are often enforceable. There's some uh, legislation that requires certain contracts to be in writing, such as contracts for the sale of land or a dealing in land such as a, a mortgage or a lease. Um, deeds must be in writing. Although not required in all cases, uh, it's recommended that parties document their agreements in writing. Why, why, why is this? Um, a written contract provides greater evidence of the existence of the contract and of its terms. Um, now, OK, so we, say there's a contract in, on foot. How do you vary or terminate it? Um, oral or verbal contracts can be varied or terminated orally. It is a standard clause in many written contracts that the contract can only be varied by agreement in writing signed by the parties. Likewise, uh, it's often the case that uh, the contract says termination must be done by written notice to the other party. Um, when varying or uh, amending a, an agreement, it's good practice and advisable uh, to use a deed. Um, there's a rule that past consideration is not good consideration. This means that consideration provided for past acts will not apply to future arrangements between the parties. Therefore, any amendment or variation may not be supported by consideration unlike the original contract. So to avoid any uncertainty, people should use a deed as we've seen that does not require consideration. Um, where termination of a contract is by agreement between the parties and there are no outstanding disputes between them, um, it's recommended that the parties sign a deed of settlement and release to clarify that there are no outstanding liabilities arising from the contract uh, or its termination or alternatively to deal with any outstanding issues. So. How do you sign a contract? Um, this depends on who, who's signing it. Now, in the case of individuals, this is straightforward as you'd expect, the individual needs to sign under their own name. Um, when, uh, unless there's a power of attorney, and then the attorney will sign it on behalf of the person who has granted the, attorney, the power of attorney. When signing deeds, an individual's Signature needs to be witnessed by a third party who is not a party to the deed. Um, the witness must actually see the person sign the document, not just merely attest to this after the fact. It's good practice for an individual's signature on, on any document to be witnessed by a third party. That will be helpful if there is a subsequent dispute about the authenticity of the individual's signature. Um, if the document is especially important, the individual's signature should be witnessed by a solicitor or justice of the peace. Now, so how does a, has a company sign a contract? The Corporations Act provides that a company can sign a contract by two directors signing it, a director and secretary signing it, or in the case of a sole director, that sole director uh, signing the document. Or, and it's less common these days, for a company to affix its common seal to the document, uh, which is witnessed by uh, any of the above uh, methods, you know, directors or director and secretary. Um, now, that's not the end of it for companies. Um, a company uh, can also be bound uh, if a person has express authority. Now, that could be evidenced by a power of attorney or a resolution of the Board of Directors authorising that person to sign on behalf of the company in a transaction, uh, implied actual authority, such as a managing director appointed by the Board who can exercise the powers usually held by a person in such a position, or by uh, the company can also be bound by a person with apparent or ostensible authority. That means um, where the company's board represents to another 
party that the person has authority to sign on behalf of a company. For example, a sales manager. The form may well say, uh, may, well, may well provide for its signature by a sales manager. So clearly, in that context, the company has represented to the customer that the sales manager can bind the company. But uh, conversely, a person cannot bind the company when the other party knows or reasonably suspects that the person does not have authority to bind the company. Um, now, how does a trust sign a contract? Now, a trust uh, does not have the powers of a legal person. By that, we mean that it's not capable of signing contracts under its no own name. It doesn't have its own legal existence. But it, it will, however, have a trustee which must sign on behalf of the trust. A trustee may be an individual or a company, in which case the principles we've discussed apply in relation to the signing of documents by the trust. Um, when signing a document on behalf of a trust, the trustee must, uh, must express to be signing the document in its, in its capacity as trustee of the trust, not simply in its own right. Um, where there's any uncertainty, uh, it's a good idea to verify that the trustee has been duly appointed and not removed. Um, if the deal is important enough, you can ask for a copy of the trustee and any amendments to that trustee certified by somebody with authority, such as a director of the trustee. Um, there, there are other formalities to sign a contract. Um, it's not a general requirement for the parties to initial every page, uh, although the parties may wish to do so. Um, leases, for example, must be initialed by the parties on the first and last of, uh, page of every annexure in order to be registered. There may be some lingering distrust between the parties, uh, so it's a good idea in that case to sign every page to minimise the chances of substitution of a page. Um, it's also a good practice for the parties to initially changes, uh, to initially any changes made in handwriting to a written contract, for example, at the last minute. Parties can sign and exchange most commercial contracts in counterparts. By that I mean each party will sign one original copy and send it to the other. In other words, they do not need to sign the same original copy. Another example of that is a contract for the sale of land. Usually the vendor signs one copy and the purchaser signs another and they both don't sign the same copy. Um, now, what are some of the, the key terms of a, of a contract? Um, warranties are an important element of this. Um, warranties are promises about the subject matter of the contract. Subject matter of a contract can be, for example, a car that exist at the date of entering into the contract uh, or at some other date, such as the date of completion of that contract. Um, in a sale of goods or a sale of a business, for example, uh, the vendor or the seller will typically provide warranties to the purchaser as an inducement for the purchaser to enter into the contract, although the purchaser may also provide basic warranties to the vendor in those situations. Um, the purchaser will often enter into the contract in reliance on the warranties and the vendor will be liable to pay damages if the warranties are untrue or inaccurate. Therefore, warranties are often a major issue in commercial negotiations. Um, examples of warranties could be the vendor owns the goods or the property to be sold. Uh, the, the goods or property are free from any encumbrances, in other words, any debts. Um, the contract relates to shares in a company. The company is not insolvent. The company hasn't had an administrator or receiver appointed. The company is duly incorporated. The company has paid its taxes as and when they fall due. The company's balance sheet and its financial statements reflect a true and fair view of the company's financial position as at a certain date. Um, the difference between a warranty and other terms of the contract is that generally breach of a warranty 
will only entitle the innocent party to damages, whereas breach of an essential term, uh, that is a term which is of such importance that the parties would not have entered into the contract without it, will allow the innocent party to terminate the contract in addition to recovering damages. That's not to say, of course, that a warranty may not be an essential term. Warranties may also be implied by law. You may have heard of the Australian Consumer Law, or ACL. Um, now, under that, that's federal legislation, um, consumer guarantees apply to consumer contracts where the price of the goods or services is less than $40,000, or uh, if it's greater than 40000 the goods or services are of a kind ordinarily required for personal, domestic or household use or consumption. Now, um, in the case of a supply of goods, the ACL provides for compulsory consumer guarantees, you know, warranties in relation to title, undisturbed possession, freedom from undisclosed security interests or encumbrances, acceptable quality, fitness for purpose, for the disclosed purpose, that they match the description, say in a catalogue or on display, uh, they match the sample or a demonstration model that may have been provided, uh, that there will be repairs and adequate spare parts available and that there will actually be compliance with any express warranties made by the supplier. Um, in the case of a supply of services, the ACL imposes consumer guarantees in relation to due care and skill, fitness for purpose, and uh, it will be supplied within a reasonable time. These consumer guarantees cannot be excluded, restricted or modified by the terms of the contract. Um, so that's, that, we've talked about warranties. Now, often you, you might hear of indemnities, um, but what's an indemnity? An indemnity is a promise from A to make whole B if B suffers a loss or damage as a result of, of A's breach of contract, or breach of a warranty or some other misconduct. Uh, an indemnity is, in addition to other remedies B may have, such as a general right to damages under the contract, because it is a promise to make whole any loss or liability suffered by B, indemnities in a contract are usually sought after by the party receiving the benefit of them, which not surprising, and also not surprising, resisted by the party bearing the bur burden of providing that indemnity. Um, now, what's a condition precedent in a, in a contractual setting? A condition precedent is a condition which must be satisfied or waived before the parties can complete the transaction. Um, an example I can think of is a uh, contract which provides that the sale of a car is subject to a satisfactory mechanical inspection before the purchaser has to pay for it and take delivery. Um, conditions precedent typically feature in contracts for the sale of business and share sale agreements. Um, example, other examples of common conditions precedent in a commercial contract may be completion of due diligence by the purchaser, purchaser obtaining finance approval, the assignment of a lease of premises used in the business, obtaining the consent of shareholders, obtaining uh, approval of uh, or transfer of a government licence or a government authority, or a key employee signing an employment contract to work for the purchaser. Um, so if any of the conditions precedent are not satisfied by the completion date, then the party for whose benefit the conditions precedent or the condition precedent was provided may, not must, but may terminate the agreement uh, before completion. So in other words, the party may waive the condition. Um, the parties will be obliged to use their reasonable endeavours to ensure that conditions precedent are fulfilled. Failure to use such reasonable or best endeavours uh, may be a breach of the contract, allowing the other party to seek damages. Um, you might have heard of undertakings in the context of a contract. Uh, undertakings typically feature in contracts for the sale of business 
and share sale agreements and their obligations binding on the party, binding the party giving them between, uh, to do something between signing the agreement and completion or even after completion. Uh, maybe an undertaking to refrain from doing something, setting up a competing business afterwards. Um, now, uh, undertakings between uh, you know, sign of a contract and uh, completion given by a vendor could be uh, the vendor will run the business in the usual course of uh, business consistent with previous practice. The company will not enter into any unusual transactions or terminate any contracts except in the ordinary course or incur liabilities in excess of $50,000 without the purchaser's consent. The company will not terminate any key employees. The company will not pay any dividends between signing and completion. The company will maintain a certain minimum working capital. Um, there is typically an obligation on the vendor to notify the purchaser as soon as possible if the vendor breaches any of these undertakings or if there's a material adverse change affecting the business of the company pending completion. Um, now, guarantees. Um, often the word guarantee and warranty is used uh, without any clear distinction, but a, a guarantee has a very specific uh, meaning. Um, uh, the contract may provide a director, shareholder or other key person to provide a personal guarantee uh, of a party's obligations under a contract. Um, the other party may request the parent company of the contracting party to provide a guarantee. Now, guarantees are primary obligations in that the party receiving the benefit can seek redress from the or damages from the guarantor before claiming on the principal party. And they are continuing obligations and they will continue right up until uh, the debt is paid. So before signing a personal guarantee, um, you should seek advice uh, or uh, consider it very carefully. The personal assets of a guarantor, such as a family home or any other valuable asset, will be at risk in the event of a default by the party whose obligations have been guaranteed. Now, security interests are another uh, concept we, we should have a look at. Certain contracts, such as those involving vendor finance, supply of goods on credit, higher purchase agreement and equipment leases, typically include retention of title clauses, which provide that the vendor owns the goods or the personal property until they're paid for, and that the vendor may enter onto the purchaser's land or property to repossess the goods in the event of a default. Um, properly drafted contracts uh, should include references to security interests created under the Personal Property Securities Act, or the PPSA, as it's commonly called. Um, this is a piece of Commonwealth legislation that's come into uh, being in recent years and um, governs this area. Um, such a clause will allow the vendor to register their interest on the Personal Property Securities Register, or the PPSR, which is a publicly searchable register. Registration may restrict the ability of the purchaser to deal with the property until the interest is released by the vendor. Contracts for the supply of goods on credit generally allow the debtor to sell goods to customers in the ordinary course of business, but the proceeds of sale will be charged in favour of the secured creditor. Contracts often include a limitation of liability clause. Vendors will usually try to limit their liability through exclusion or disclaimer clauses. Examples of such clauses include imposing a cap on damages or a maximum aggregate liability under the contract, which is usually equal to the purchase price of the goods Imposing a time limit for bringing warranty or indemnity claims, for example, one or two years after completion may well be the time limit agreed. Excluding all implied terms, conditions, warranties and representations to the extent permitted by law. As we've seen, under the ACL, 
certain things cannot be excluded. Um, uh, the clause may exclude damages for indirect or consequential losses, for example, loss of profit or loss of business opportunity. Um, limitation of liability clauses uh, exclude, may exclude damages which were caused or contributed to by the purchaser. Um, may require the purchaser to mitigate their losses um, or minimise their losses. They may be, they may qualify the warranties to uh, that which was known to the person providing them uh, the warranty at uh, a particular time. Uh, the limitation clause may impose minimum and collective thresholds for a damages claim. In other words, amounts that be, must be satisfied uh, or reached before a claim can be made. Now, um, the ACL deals with unfair contract terms. Um, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act, ASIC, uh, Act contains equivalent provisions um, for unfair contracts in standard form contracts for financial products or services. Um, now, standard form consumer contracts or small business contracts for goods um, are covered in this area. Um, we've looked at the definition earlier of a consumer contract. Now, a small business contract is one uh, where at least one of the people in the contract, the parties to the contract, is a small business employing fewer than 20 people and the upfront price payable does not exceed $300,000. Or if the contract has a duration of more than 12 months, uh, the price does not exceed $1 million. Now, a standard contract is a contract where one of the parties does not have the opportunity to negotiate uh, the terms and conditions. In other words, they are provided on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. A term of a consumer or small business contract may well be unfair if it would cause a significant imbalance in the rights and obligations of the parties, or if it's reasonably not reasonably necessary to protect the legitimate interests of the party advantaged by the term, or if it would cause detriment, a financial detriment or otherwise, to a party if it were relied on. Uh, Examples of unfair contract terms uh, include um, a term that permits one party to avoid or limit performance of the contract, uh, a term that permits one party but not the other party to terminate the contract, a, party, a term that penalises one party but not the other for breach or termination, um, a term that permits one party but not the other to vary the terms, a term that permits one party but not the other to renew or not to renew the contract, a term that permits one party to assign the contract to the detriment of the other party without that other party's consent. Many standard form contracts contain such unfair contract terms which may well be void under the legislation. Um, I'd suggest that suppliers should review their standard form contracts and seek legal advice on, the, on them to ensure uh, compliance um, uh, with the ACL and other legislation. So just to summarise, uh, we've looked at how contracts are formed, unwritten and unsigned contracts, how contracts can be varied and terminated, how, how to sign a contract, and we've looked at differences between individuals, companies and trusts. Um, we looked at the key terms of a contract. We've had a look at uh, unfair contract terms. So um, I encourage you to, uh, you know, if it's important enough, uh, to seek advice in relation to the negotiation, preparation, signing and performance of a contract. Um, I've actually uh, been lucky enough to receive some questions uh, today, which I'll have a go at answering for you. So just excuse me. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got a question from Grace. Um, will you be distributing slides at the end of the webcast? Uh, yes, we will um, 
uh, we will uh, email them out to people, um, certainly. Uh, now, Daya asks, what is the responsibility of a witness if there is a dispute about the agreement? What will happen to the witness? Can the witness end up going to court? Well, the answer is certainly yes, if the witness can be identified. So if there's a, simply a squiggle for the witness's signature, it may be harder to identify the witness. But if it's clear who the witness was, yes, the witness may well be called to court and therefore it's imperative that the witness has done the right thing and actually witnessed the signature. It will quickly come out if the witness has done somebody a favour and signed it after the event. So, yes, um, uh, as ever... Uh, think through the consequences of your actions if you sign a document and make sure you do it properly. Um, now, Michael asks an interesting question. Um, letters of intent, term sheets, memorandum of understanding, heads of agreement and agreement to purchase in regard to a business contract, are they all one and the same? I would say yes, they're all uh, terms that used interchangeably by uh, business brokers and you know, uh, real estate agents and uh, people. Uh, uh, yes, they're all, they're all much the same sort of thing uh, and the same issues apply uh, as we've seen, whether uh, they are intended to be binding and uh, whether they're not intended to be binding. But even if they're not intended to be binding, it's imperative, I think, that they clearly set out as closely as possible the uh, deal struck between the parties because if there is a subsequent uh, debate about what was agreed, inevitably the parties will go back to the term sheet or the heads of agreement and say, well, yeah, look, that, that's what we agreed and shook on. Now, Vivian asks a question. Uh, if a company has three directors and wants to ensure that the company executes a document or enters into any other contracts... Uh, that a particular director must be one of the signing directors, can this be achieved by resolution of the board of directors? Yes, it can. The problem there in that situation is to make sure that the people who you deal with are aware of that. So I would have thought that at the outset when you are dealing with uh, somebody, you need to give them a copy of that board resolution and say, yes... A, B and C are directors of the company, but uh, we will only be bound if, for example, C is one of the signatories. Um, now, uh, Doug asks an interesting question. Um, is there much uh, difference between the states in this area? I think the answer is no. Um, a lot of these rules or principles stem from English law, which applies throughout Australia... Um, there was some state legislation, such as state sale of goods legislation, uh, many years ago. But these days, things tend to be uh, embodied in Commonwealth legislation. Um, the ACL is an example. Um, yeah. Now, um, Fred asks an interesting question. Um, why do land contracts need to be in writing? Well, this actually goes back to... Uh, medieval English times when, and I think it was probably because land was such an important thing, that um, to avoid fraud or somebody selling something that uh, the owner didn't um, uh, want to be sold, uh, there was a requirement that a sale of an interest in land be uh, in writing, just as um, these days there's a land titles office registry where... Uh, people's ownership of interest in land is um, is uh, recorded, um, and that uh, that requirement uh, is in the today's modern conveyancing legislation. Um, now, the final question from Peter uh, is: What if the purchaser wants to impose its trading terms? Well, um, uh, there, there needs to be a sensible discussion between the seller and the purchaser as to whose terms will apply and that needs to be um, uh, expressly uh, set out. In other words, it needs to say, yes, it's agreed that uh, A's terms apply or B's 
terms apply. Uh, it's not something in that situation that can be ignored because ultimately there could very well be a conflict between those terms and uh, an argument about whether, for example, there's a retention of title clause, whether the uh, goods have to be paid for in 10 days or 100 days or whether there's interest for late payment. So all sorts of competing issues between the seller and the purchaser may arise unless it's very clear uh, from the outset whose terms um, uh, apply. So um, uh, the, uh, that's the end of those interesting questions. Thank you, everybody, for, for asking them. Uh, and that uh, concludes our, um, our, our, our webcast. Uh, thank you for uh, registering and tuning in. I hope you've uh, found that uh, informative. Um, and please remember, if you have any further questions or if you'd like to discuss any uh, specific matter relating to contracts or commercial law generally, please uh, contact me uh, at Matthews Filebeak Lawyers. Our, our details are there on the screen. We'd be happy to have a, uh, have a chat to you. Uh, thank you very much.